All right, hello, and thank you for joining us today as we continue the 2023 Historic Artist Homes and Studios Virtual Road Trip with the third stop on this year's journey, the T.C. Steele State Historic Site. The Historic Artist Homes and Studios Virtual Road Trip is a collaboration between, uh, between the James Castle House, operated by the Boise City Department of Arts and History, and the Historic Artist Homes and Studios Program, also referred to as HAWS, which is a program of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. With 55 locations across 25 states, all of which were the former homes and working studios of American artists, Pause is dedicated to preserving the nation's legacy of creativity and connecting visitors with these irreplaceable spaces. The James Castle House and Haas launched this virtual road trip in the summer of 2021, a time when travel was limited due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Longing for an adventure, we found inspiration in the recently published Guide to Historic Artists, Homes, and Studios, written by Valerie Blunt, the director of Haas. And with a desire to dig deeper into these extraordinary sites, the virtual road trip was born. My name is Mackenzie Dunstan, and I'll be your guide on this year's virtual road trip. I serve as the Education and Outreach Coordinator at the James Castle House in Boise, Idaho, which is located on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Shoshone, Bannock, and Northern Paiute people. With me today is Valerie Blint, the Director of Haas, Jessica Stevens, Site Manager for the TC Steel State Historic Site, and providing American Sign Language interpretation is Lavona Andrew Carson. Along with ASL interpretation, English language captions are available by clicking on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and then selecting show subtitle. So live transcript, show subtitle. Today's event uh, has a runtime of about 75 minutes. We strongly encourage your questions and ask that you send them to us via the Q&A box. At the end of this presentation, we will answer as many of your questions as we can. You can also look forward to links to related events, resources, and mailing lists, which will be available uh, through the chat feature. If you can, uh, definitely stick around for the Q&A portion as we often learn many fascinating details uh, not always covered in the main presentation. So please note that this event is being recorded and will be made available online in the coming days. So because this is a road trip, albeit a virtual one, I'd like to start by highlighting a few notable attractions you would pass on your way between last month's stop, the Cal Sharp Historic Site in Taos, New Mexico, and today's destination, the PC Steel State Historic Site in Nashville, Indiana. So we're heading east, um, and we're first going to stop at Dorothy's House in the Land of Oz Museum in the small town of Liberal, Kansas. There really is no place like home, uh, and this 1907 farmhouse has been carefully remodeled to be an exact replica of the set from The Wizard of Oz. Beyond a guided tour of the house, where the docent's uniform uh, consists of a blue gingham dress and pigtails, visitors can also explore a 5,000 square foot exhibit, an animated journey through the movie, uh, which is also available on the property. Continuing on to Wichita, Kansas, we'll tour the village, which is a found materials art environment by sculptor Gary Pendergrass. A retired home remodeler, Pendergrass has transformed his suburban house into a wonderland of sci-fi and steampunk inspired assemblages made from scrap and discarded materials, uh, many of which include kinetic elements or water features. The site is free and open to the public to visit, and the artist himself uh, offers tours if you can find him amongst his labyrinth of creations. Passing through Kansas City, there is so much to explore. It was very hard to narrow things down, um, but some top picks for me include uh, the National Museum of Toys and Miniatures, the Hallmark Greeting Card Visitor Center and Museum, and my personal favorite, the Treasures of the Steamboat Arabia Museum which displays 200 tons of pioneer artifacts recovered from an 1856 Missouri River shipwreck. After a full day of museums, um, you of course have to enjoy a hearty dinner from any of Casey's nationally recognized barbecue joints. Forging ahead to St. Louis, Missouri, uh, consider visiting not only the iconic landmarks such as the Gateway Arch National Park, Union Station, or the St. Louis Wheel, uh, but consider some of the off the beat attractions as well. Two at the top of my list include the Venice Cafe, a basement level bar where mosaics and quirky assemblages blanket every visible surface, and we're talking every surface. Um, and the City Museum, an enormous wonderland constructed from reclaimed materials, including remnants of historical buildings, where visitors are encouraged to touch, climb, and play on the exhibits. 
So after just a few more hours east, we'll finally cross the border into Indiana. And I'd now like to invite Valerie to share some of her recommendations when traveling in this area. Thank you, Mackenzie, to you and everyone involved at the James Castle House for spearheading this third year of the virtual road trip in collaboration with Historic Artist Homes and Studios. And I'm excited this evening that we will travel to another site which represents several artistic legacies, that of T.C. Steele, of course, but also the contributions of his creative wife, Selma, and a touchstone for the entire Hoosier group of American Impressionist painters. So to understand the place that both transformed, uh, was transformed by Steele and by which he was inspired, it's vital to get a sense of the light, atmosphere, and natural splendors that mark this region, and um, I got to experience that while driving through Indiana last year on my own real road trip to Iowa. And it was on that drive that I came to really appreciate the connection between Steele, his artist colleagues, and the land, and how they placed their own signature mark on plein air and impressionist painting in this country. As our host this evening, Jessica Stevens is going to further reveal to us. Those artists who first ventured out to this region of Indiana are part of the reason we get to experience the vibrant town of Nashville as it is today. So we're gonna start in town, sampling what it has to offer. So known as the co art colony of the Midwest, Nashville attracts those who create art and those who also collect it. Shopping downtown takes you to quaint, locally owned shops selling everything from clothing and jewelry to home decor and original arts and craft. Both antique and contemporary choices abound as you meander through these enticing streets full of alleyways and secret hideaways and hidden gems. There is new treasure to discover around every corner. Make sure your walkabout includes a stop at the Brown County Pottery, a working studio since 1968. The Brown County Playhouse also beckons. Uh, see a movie or a show. This place has served as a hub for entertainment here since 1949. Touchstones back to rural roots are really never very far away. If you start looking, you will soon see the simple log cabin architecture that is a long standing hallmark of this area. Venture out a bit further and visit the picturesque scene created by the 19th century Bean Blossom Covered Bridge, one of the state's most loved painted and photographed structures, which is regularly featured in paintings and magazines throughout this country. And so scenes like these are what painting in this region was and is all about. So we're gonna go back into town and visit just a few of the many, and I mean many, spaces to view, learn about, and purchase art that is firmly rooted in this place. The first stop is the Brown County Art Gallery, founded almost 100 years ago, and which today is home to 60 working artists, as well as an important collection of historic art. The Art Guild was founded in the 1950s and retains the impressive 19th century minor house as its central home. And here you can see paintings by founding artists like that um, you see in the upper screen as well as those by um, current working members of the Guild. The Brown County Craft Gallery, an artist cooperative, has been a favorite place for visitors since the 1970s, featuring a wide variety of weaving, knitting, pottery, jewelry, baskets, and metalwork, among other things. And the Hoosier Art Gallery is another artist co-op, which offers fine arts and crafts by Southern Indiana artists. So if you want to explore even more, haven't had enough, attend a village art walk um, held every fourth Friday, April through October, and enjoy a self-guided tour of numerous art galleries as long as complimentary refreshments, music, and sometimes dinner specials at participating restaurants. But now let's get into the landscape that inspired so many artists in this area. We're going to start at Yellowwood State Forest, named for a tree rarely found this far north in the United States. You can hike, you can fish, you can pan for gold, or be to the first to solve the incredibly intriguing mystery of how large sandstone boulders, which you see on screen, wound up in the upper branches of several majestic trees. 
Or you may consider spending time in Indiana's largest park, Brown County uh, State Park, a traditional fall color hotspot with nearly 20 miles of tree-lined roads and many scenic vistas overlooking uninterrupted forest land. It's also known for its rugged bike trails. You can camp out, rough out, or stay at the Abe Martin Lodge, which also features a large scale, and I mean super large scale, indoor water park. The Saddle Barn can outfit you to explore via horseback or to go on a hayride with the kids. Don't leave without climbing the 90 foot fire tower to witness some unbelievable scenery. For more adventure, take Explore Brown County's Zipline Canopy Tour. Um, perhaps you prefer uh, to experience a less strenuous outdoor vibe. Uh, Treblack Bluffs Preserve promises walks along the Bean Blossom Creek and an abundance of song from the migratory birds who breed here. Um, we need to maybe refuel from all of this activity and back in town, there is a thriving, and I mean, just sort of crazy thriving, like I it was completely unaware, abundant food scene. Uh, there is so much to choose from. Here are just a few of the delights that await. Mouth-watering breakfast treats are calling at Emma's from the Cornerstone Inn. If you want to sleep in a little, the bird's nest promises an amazing brunch and you can relax in the gazebo. In the center of town, the Artist Colony Inn offers both food and lodging. You can indulge by sitting on the porch or cozy up in um, cooler weather in front of the fireplace. Part eatery, this might be my favorite, part eatery and part mercantile. The Nashville house is renowned for savory home cooking and is crammed with antique collectibles and gadgets of all types for the choosing. Um, the quaint Hobnob Cafe with his historic clock across the street entices with bratwurst and sausages, sauerkraut, excuse me, or biscuits and gravy and soup of the day. But maybe you just want some pizza and big wood uh, weights. And the founders are also behind an incredibly successful brewing company and the Hard Truth Distillery. And just minutes from town, you can venture out to their sprawling campus and attend a mixology workshop, take in a concert in their outdoor terrace, or sample innovative spirits like cinnamon vodka or peanut butter whiskey. Uh, can't wait. If wine is more your style, take a trip to Brown County Winery where you can watch wines being made through windows in the tasting room. And if you seek a more rural dining experience, the Farmhouse Cafe is a short scenic drive from town and it's nestled in the Brown County Hills. And here you can dine on salads made from garden produce and sandwiches featuring herbal spreads made on premise. Having embraced the many, many, and barely scratched the surface delights of Nashville, Bloomington, which also plays a part in T.C. Steele's story, is our next stop. And so more about the Bloomington Steel connection a little later. This university city lies an hour, about an hour uh, southwest. And once there, take in a food scene at 4th Street, known as International Row, in the area known as the Square, stop by the county courthouse and look up at the amazing rotunda ceiling or check out the Orbit, a local dive bar known for its pinball machines and great hot dogs. Venture to Kirkwood Avenue, the most iconic street in Bloomington, and you can eat outside on a picnic table near the university gates, or check out the beautifully restored Bus Kirk Chumley Theater, originally built as a silent movie house in the 1920s. Shops literally promise something for everyone, from Hoosier basketball gear, to vintage clothing, to seemingly endless shelves of books, used books at caveat and tour. Maybe you're looking for something a little more unique. Take a selfie in front of one of the city's many murals, rejuvenate at the Himalayan pink salt cave, explore the beautiful 90 acre property, impressive tem temple and sand mandala at the Tibetan Mongolian Buddhist Culture Center. But what's on my bucket list is at the bottom right, the suite at the Garden Bloomington Hotel, which replicates rooms from the Netflix uh, great series Stranger Things. And I confess I am a super fan. So this is somewhere I'm definitely going to go. 
If you want to sip some wine to wind down, nearby Oliver Winery is the largest in Indiana. But if you prefer a bird's eye view of all of it, your own hot air balloon uh, excursion awaits. You may want to plan your trip around one of Bloomington's many festivals. In spring, attend the early musical festival, and that means music made before Beethoven, which draws performers and scholars from all over the world. Or come in the fall for the Lotus World Music and Art Festival, a four-day event that brings thousands to this city. If we were in Bloomington right now, and I mean literally right now, we'd be enjoying Grand Balloon, which every summer brings together as musicians, artists, thinkers, and people from all walks of life, also known as the Kurt Vonnegut um, Festival, inspired by the Hoosier author and his interest in folk societies, or the annual Labor Day weekend, 4th Street Fair promises you booths and booths of artisan craft. This region also opportuni offers opportunities to commune with nature, 10 miles southeast, Join, enjoy boating, swimming, hiking, or fishing on Monroe Lake, which is actually a reservoir and the largest man-made body of water in Indiana. In 30 minutes from the university, the city seems a world away as you immerse yourself in the Hoosier National Forest or the Charles Deem Wilderness Preserve. Or just find an oasis right in town, walk through Bryan Park's um, numerous acres, cool off on the splash pad, at the Switchyard Park, which originally served as a railroad hub, or set off on a bike along the city's many, many paved trails. When you're ready to do some more exploring, visit the Wiley Historic House, former home of the university's first president. And on your way out, make sure to purchase some heirloom seeds from their garden. Consider taking a workshop at the world-renowned Kinsey Institute for Research in Sex, Gender, and Reproduction. And don't miss the recently erected life-size statue of the groundbreaking researcher himself, Alfred Kinsey. And Wonderland Wonder Lab awaits you with science-based activities that will amaze those who are young or just young at heart. Come in April 2024 for prime viewing of the full solar eclipse. Or set off for the goat conspiracy farm. Buy some soap, sample some cheese during an event uh, evening concert on the grounds or get limber doing goat yoga um, on, on the farm. Uh, we've experienced so much of what Bloomington has to offer, but no visit would be complete without spending some time on campus, where T.C. Steele served as an artist in residence. The stately Lilly Library displays an unexpected, fun collection of mechanical puzzles, some of which you can actually try out. A visit to the art museum is like taking an art, artistic trip around the world, discovering um, treasures from antiquity to Monet paintings to works by living artists. You can view um, student art exhibitions at the Grunwald Gallery in the Fine Arts Building, go see a film at the historic 1930s cinema, one of the nation's most prestigious art house theaters, or an opera or ballet at the acclaimed Jacobs School of Music. Finish your visit at the iconic Memorial Hall, originally built in 1906, which remains one of the largest student union buildings in the country. And I think it's fun to think about the fact that this building was here while Steele was actually alive and on campus. But Steele's heart was always tied to the property he transformed in Nashville where like other artists we've selected for this year's road trip, he integrated his art with his life philosophy. And who, like those other artists, after being formally and academically trained, set off on his own path about defining what art could and should be from his perspective. Choosing this locale, he was instrumental in establishing an art community that was distinct from those in the East, and as we've already seen, as we visited Nashville, still indoors today. To visit his former home and all that it encompasses is to experience the very essence of what is so special about preserved artists' homes and studios. We are completely immersed in the environment 
that fueled his creativity for decades. It is a rare privilege to be able to stand and look out at what the artists saw all around us. In a manner of speaking, we step into the paintings themselves. And then those same scenes, we are then present on the walls of the Steele's home and studio, experiencing that direct connection between place and practice. It's very powerful and it cannot be replicated anywhere else. Thank you, Mackenzie, for our continued collaboration and to you, Jessica, for revealing, I know, what is gonna be some real magic about what else Steele created here. Welcome. Thank you both um, for the warm welcome. Um, I'm so happy to be here tonight. Um, as Valerie said, my name is Jessica Stevens and I'm the site manager at the TC Steele State Historic Site. I'm also the State Historic Sites Program Manager for ISMHS's 11 historic sites across the state. ISM, um, ISMHS, um, our mission is to serve as a catalyst for informal lifelong learning that connects to the stories of real people, places, and things. Our vision is to be the leader in lifelong learning that is recognized, sought after, and celebrated regionally, nationally, and globally. We begin by acknowledging that the ground on which we stand here at TC Steel State Historic Site is the traditional home of the Miami, Shawnee, Peoria, Kickapoo, and other nations. We honor with gratitude the land and recognize our responsibilities to those nations who were forcibly removed from Indiana lands. We strive to address that history and let it guide our work in the present and the future. The TC Steel State Historic Site is part of a statewide system that includes the Indiana State Museum and 11 historic sites across the state. Located in Brown County, we are in Belmont, centered between Nashville, 14 miles to the northeast, and Bloomington, which is 10 miles to the west. Theodore Clement Steele was born on September 11, 1847 to parents Samuel and Harriet Steele. His father was a leathersmith and farmer, and Theodore was the oldest of five boys. In 1852, the family moved to Waveland, Indiana to give their children a proper education at the Waveland Collegiate Institute. It was at Waveland Steele became interested in art. An uncle gave Steele a small paint set when he was just five years old and his interest grew from there. He began formal art training at the Waveland Colleg Collegiate Institute at 12 years old, and he began teaching those drawing classes at the age of 13. Samuel passed away when the painter was just 14 years old, so TC assumed the man of the household role as he took over much of the farming. However, his mother was very supported, supportive of his interest in art and encouraged him to continue with his art education. Steele soon uh, started painting or oil paintings um, of his friends and family. And he officially became an instructor of drawing and painting when he was 18 years old at Waveland. Three years later, he graduated. Steele met his first wife, Libby Lakin, in 1867 at the Waveland Institute. She and Theodore spent their time reading their favorite poet, Keats, together. You can see here images of an extremely past due library book of Keats where he drew Libby's eyes on the pages. The couple were married in 1870, having five children, five of which lived into adulthood. Rembrandt, you might um, guess where he got that name, Seal's favorite painter. He was called Brandt, Margaret was called Daisy, and his youngest son was Shirley. Hoping to gain some instruction, Seal spent some time in Chicago. 
His painting, A Revolutionary Bell, is Steele's copy of a Gilbert Stewart painting that he created during this period. TC also spent time in Cincinnati and won the top prize in his school exhibition, the school likely being the McMicken School of Art and Design. In 1870, the couple moved to Battle Creek, Michigan, where Steele opened his first studio. In he was inspired by nature while in Michigan and did many landscape studies. From his journal, Seal explained, while I lounged under the shadow of a beautiful elm and studied the light and shade, or rather drank it in, the glorious colors that composed the beautiful dreamy landscape, I could not wish but for more time and opportunity to de devote to the study of landscape art. Few of Steele's paintings from the 70s are known. He painted himself, members of his family, and the occasional commission portrait, one of those being of James Upton in 1871. While living in Indianapolis a few years later, Steele befriended a frame shop and gallery owner named Herman Lieber. Through Lieber, Steele was sponsored to study at the Royal Academy in Munich, Germany, with the help of 12 German businessmen from the community of Indianapolis. The deal was that he would repay the men in portraits when he returned to Indianapolis or in paintings that he created while abroad. In 1880, Steele and his wife and their three children boarded the ship for Germany, intending to live in Germany for one to two years to study portraiture in the style of German realism. On the ship were four other Indiana artists, John Otis Adams, Samuel Richards, August Metzner, and Carrie Wolf. Later, William Forsyth would join them at the Royal Academy. A year had quickly come and gone, and Steele wrote to Lieber, asking for support for just one more year of study, and Lieber and the others obliged. Another year had passed, and Steele wrote to Lieber, you know, if I just had one more year. Steele would end up staying in Germany for a total of five years. Painted in 1884 as his student exhibi exhibition piece, The Boatman, one of Steele's finest earliest works, greatly differs in style from his later Impressionist paintings. Distinguished by its skillful depiction of the strain of labored rowing, The Boatman won a silver medal at the Royal Academy. weekends and during the summer, Steele would spend time outside of the city, painting the German landscape with other young American painters. Under the direction of a Boston native and early Impressionist Frank Curier, it was during this time that Steele discovered his love for landscape painting in plain air. When he returned to the United States in 1885, Steele was determined to support his family by taking every portrait commission offered. But when he was able, he painted the Indiana landscape. While many artists were moving to larger air, urban areas along the East Coast, several Indiana um, artists who studied abroad decided to return to Indiana to be true to their supporters, their sponsors, but they also found Indiana to be beautiful and just as de uh, deserving of any canvas um, as you would see in Europe. Of these artists who studied at the Royal Academy, Steele, Forsyth, Ad and Adams, they would paint and exhibit together from 1880 to 1915. They were dubbed the Hoosier Group with the additions of Otto Stark and Richard Gruwell. These Hoosiers held great enthusiasm for the Indiana landscape, and together they developed their own variant of Impressionism. 
I strongly encourage anyone interested in Indiana art to look up this group of artists, as I will not dive into their impact today. In 1893, steel was included in the World's Columbian Exhibition, also known as the Chicago World's Fair, where his work was exhibited with the Impressionists of America section. This took steel by surprise, as since it was here that steel was seeing his first Impressionist paintings. Afterwards, his palette became brighter and his brush strokes looser, similar to the French Impressionists that he had seen. Painted just after his visit to the Chicago World's Fair, the painting on the screen, The Bloom of the Grape, named after a John Keats poem, I Stood Tiptoe, shifts Steele's style more towards Impressionism with his palette. This is one of Steele's most celebrated landscapes, and it received an honorable mention in the 1900 World's Fair in Paris, which brought international attention to Indiana art. Entering a so-called white period that roughly simulated Monet's Impressionism, his paintings of Vernon, Indiana in 93 and 94 were remarkably brighter. His spectrum shifts around the color wheel from warm yellows and greens to a range of blues, purples, oranges, and reds. Though Steele found room to criticize the French for what he called their disdain for solid drawing and their overly scientific objectification of light, he welcomed the French Impressionists as liberators from the old conventions and soon he would become the premier painter in Indiana. He explains the movement as the Impressionists play, painting out of doors as it has never been painted before. This is particularly true of sunlight. The old way of painting sunlight in deep shadow is discarded and even shadows are pointed, luminous, and full of color as, the, as they really are in nature. The whole picture is keyed up. Many tones and blackness has disappeared. The sunlight diffuses color. The atmosphere trembles with it, and the Impressionist tries to paint its vibration. Meanwhile, in Indianapolis, um, it was rapidly growing and changing. In the 1890s, a bicycle craze swept Indianapolis, and Theodore was right in the midst of the fun. Libby wrote to Brandt that Steele was having some fun, if you call some pretty heavy falls fun. It took him some time to learn how to ride a bike, but once he did, he was rolling. Libby goes on to explain that several thousand wheeled riders took over Meridian Street at night. Speaking of wheeled rides, T.C. Steele had his own studio wagon. The whole family would take trips across Indiana for Steele to paint. Due to the large cushioned seats, the whole family could ride in comfort. Family trips to note were to Indiana University for the portraits of the late professors and to Metamora for landscape painting where he often painted with the rest of his Hoosier group peers. The studio wagon made it possible for him to paint out of doors in all kinds of weather and it included a stove to keep warm. It was especially important for Libby to be comfortable on these trips because she fell ill at the end of her life. Today, you can visit Steele's studio wagon at the site. Through a grant, the Friends of T.C. Steele were awarded funding to have a studio wagon built based on descriptions of the original as a hands-on opportunity for visitors to connect with art in nature. As I mentioned, Libby fell ill. In 1899, she suffered from rheumatoid arthritis and she contracted tuberculosis. 
Steele took her and Daisy to the Appalachian Mountains in hopes that the mountain air would help her condition. However, she continued to decline. It was also during this time that Steele was named to select the American paintings at, for the World's Fair in Paris the following year. He was to go to New York in November, but he intended to stay with Libby. At her insistence, Steele finally agreed that he would go, returning as soon as possible to be with her. Just two days later, she passed away. After her passing, he found it very difficult to paint. At Daisy's insistence, they took a trip out west in 1902 to visit Steele's youngest son, Shirley, who lived in California. It was because of this trip that Steele once again found joy in painting and was inspired again by nature. Steele wouldn't stay single for long, however. In 1906, he would become engaged to Selma Neubacher. She was 35 years old, 25 years younger than Steele. She was a Pratt Institute graduate in normal art and an art educator in Indianapolis, teaching art to teachers at the Heron School of Art. She was also working as the assistant superintendent for art in the Indianapolis public schools. Sharing Steele's love for art and nature, the pair were perfectly matched. In the spring of 1907, Steele decided he needed a new painting sanctuary. He had seen pictures of the Brown County Hills and decided it may be a good place to build a home and studio. Walter, Selma's brother, would take Theodore and Selma to Brown County to look at two plots of land. Selma reflects on her two days of travel from Indianapolis to Belmont in her book, The House of the Singing Winds, as an unforgettable and dangerous experience. In large part, it was made possible due to the incorporation of the Illinois Central Railroad in 1905, making Brown County accessible for the first time. Brown County was surrounded by notoriously terrible roads that cut them off from the rest of the state. So the railroad was truly an advancement for what would soon become a tourist community. Once the couple arrived in Belmont, the hill was so steep and full of gullies that the horses could not or would not take them uphill. So they had to hike two miles uphill with mud up to their ankles. I'm very surprised Selma ever said yes after this first experience in Brown County, but we sure are happy that she did. As they viewed the property, they knew this place was where the painter could continue his work and nature would always be a source of inspiration for them both. While their home was being built by local builder, by a local builder, Steele stayed in a cabin on the property and wrote letters to Selma regularly. In one of those letters, Steele explained that artist Adolf Scholz showed up to see his building project. He wrote, he was immensely pleased with Brown County and with this region especially, and said if he could find a place to board, he might bring his family to spend the summer. Someday artists will come to this county, so possibly that you and I will be pioneers to blaze the way for future artists. At the time, they did not know just how true this statement would be. Steel married Selma on August 9, 1907. Selma was wearing her wedding dress and wedding shoes as she walked up the steps into her seasonal home in Brown County. The home wouldn't always be seasonal, however, as their first winter on record in the house was in 1912. T.C. Steele's painting of, paintings of Brown County was the country's first glimpse of this region. 
an uninterrupted landscape without industrialization obscuring the view. As you can see here, steel painted in all seasons. After Steele exhibited his Brown County paintings in Indianapolis, others, other artists were compelled by what they were seeing. Although Adolf Scholz visited Brown County in 1900 and again in 1907, Scholz would return in the summers and become a permanent resident in 1917. Because of Steele's presence in the county, Artists were drawn to Nashville, and soon there would be an established art colony here. Scholz is often credited with the initial growth of the colony because Steele's involvement with them was limited due to the distance of his home in the hills. However, Steele was the first to make Brown County his permanent residence. Because of this rich subject matter in both landscape and the people, Artists across the Midwest were attracted to the region, especially after Scholl's reports of Brown County to the artist group Palette and Chisel Club of Chicago, of which Schultz was a member. In 1908, as many as 25 artists visited Nashville, many of whom came from Chicago. Again, thanks to the railroad system for making tra travel easier than ever before, a new generation of artists were beginning to form an art colony. Earl Graff, Will Vodder, and Adolf Scholz was often depicted Nashville residents as their art subjects. They were inspired by their way of life, their log cabins, and their flower gardens. While Indiana Impressionists were inspired by the famous purple haze that Brown County supplied. Frank Hohenberger, a photographer and journalist, came to live in Brown County in 1917 to document in his weekly column called Down in the Hills of Brown County, published by the Indianapolis Star, many of which these photographs are pulled. Steele did spend time painting with the artists in the town of Nashville. However, he was most inspired by the landscape of his own home. The Steels thought they would be uninterrupted in the hills, but because their way of life differed so widely from the locals, the locals wanted to see it for themselves. The Steels were considered outsiders, but Brown County residents were curious, so they made trips up the hill to get a closer look at the painter and his wife. At the time, residents still lived in log cabins. The Steele's home was the first of its kind in the region. They could not imagine why anyone would paint a house red of all colors and why they would want an uncovered front porch. Visitors were enthralled by the oriental rug that lay on the floor in the living room. During their visits, both men and women would get on their hands and knees to examine it. Also of interest was the player piano, and the Victrola. Music was not for, foreign to the locals, but they had never heard an instrument play itself. Word of the player piano and the Victrola spread quickly, and families would drive up in their farm wagons and ask to listen to the music. The painter was up by 4.30 a.m. and set out with his canvases and paints and didn't return home until dinner time, leaving Selma to tend to their guests. She did her best to guard the working hours of the painter, but it wasn't always possible. They came up with an idea to build a studio room on the west end of the house to provide more privacy for TC when he was working indoors. When it was decided the west wing would be added, Selma made sure that a new kitchen and the enclosure of the screened-in wraparound porch would also be on the list of things to do. Growing tired of taking time out of her day to entertain guests daily, they started, they started a special offering called Our Sunday at Home in hopes that word would spread that they should only visit on Sundays while they were literally at home 
ready to entertain. Although it was a nice idea, the locals continued to show up as they pleased and Selma and TC continued to welcome them. Eventually, Selma would need help with the house indoors. Although local painters were worried about their daughters picking up what they considered to be bad habits from Selma, girls felt ready for a city job just with a few weeks of training as an employee of the Steels. Selma explains in our book that one woman showed up on her doorstep and let Selma know that she would not work for Selma or anyone else unless they were too puny to do their own work. What we have here is a culture class clash with Mrs. Steele. Some of her neighbors, however, Selma, or sorry, with her neighbors. However, Selma cared deeply for the people of Brown County and often went out of her way to help them. 90% of what you see belong to the Steels. While the Steels traveled for exhibitions and lectures across the country, Theodore would bring back arts and crafts decor to enjoy in their arts and crafts home. TC originally had green spruce wallpaper in the living room, which Selma later changed to the green color you see here. The dark wood ceilings and the green walls were another way to bring the outdoors in. This is the original bedroom. Theodore and Selma would later move into the West Wing, which are old office spaces today. Those offices were used before our visitor center was built in 2019. Originally part of the screened in wraparound porch is the study as you can see here. From the study, you move into the sleeping porch. These windows go down into the walls on a pulley system. Selma named her house the House of the Singing Winds because of the sound the breeze made as it vibrated the window screens. This paint color was matched to paint remnants left behind on the walls. Now we go into the added on kitchen, complete with a kerosene stove and water access through a cistern and pump. As they did not have running water on the hill, even today, we have water pumped into a 10,000 gallon cistern because there is no running water on this hill. This is the least authentic room in the house as most of the decor is time period specific. Moving on to the next room is on the left, a changing closet. And on the right is the original kitchen turned dining room. The local Brown County residents were also enthralled by the pantry. At this time in Brown County, because of its size and the fact that there was a door, it would have been considered a bedroom, which would have increased their taxes. So visitors would show up, listen to the music, inspect their rugs and pantry, and leave and plan to return on another day when in need of some entertainment. We believe they purchased a kerosene powered electric generator in 1918, a deco light model. To power her lights and refrigerator, Mrs. Steele's generator was probably the first of its kind in the county and enabled the Steeles to live on the hilltop with the same comforts of Indianapolis. A day at the Steels would include reading a book or listening to classical music, specifically German composers. Steel himself played the flute, Daisy played the piano, and Shirley played the cello. Steel had synesthesia, so music often inspired his art and his daily life. It is important to point out that by this time, TC and Selma lived in this home, his children were grown adults, um, similar to the age of Selma. However, their children, and their, sorry, their grandchildren um, and Steele's children would come and visit the house of the singing winds. Selma find time for her own art making and her own artistic nature can be seen throughout the site today. 
we have reproductions of her stencil designs out on the table as though she had just gotten up from working on them. Her designs are also on the cabinetry and on some of the curtains. Not only was she the designer of the interior of their home, but the exterior as well. Selma grew up an educated city girl. Although she knew living in near isolation would be unlike anything she ever experienced, Selma didn't shy away from a challenge. In 1907, the land was harsh and overgrown and exhausted from over farming and logging. So she spent a lot of time designing the landscape. When she arrived, she didn't know how to grow food or cook. So when she took her grocery list to the general store down the road, she was told that people around here grow these items themselves. Mrs. Parks from Parks Farm down the hill helped Selma learn how to cook and how to plant food. It would be impossible to talk about T.C. Steele and not talk about Selma, supporting the painter by finding ways to make their life in Brown County efficient and comfortable. She, Selma ran the household, both indoors and outdoors, as I feel you may be catching on to by now. She saw flower garden, her flower gardens as an experiment and she was good at it, although she found much difficulty planting on such a steep hillside. The extensive gardens on the property that Selma created inspired the painter, as she called him, and this delighted Selma. Her flowers can be seen throughout his works during this Brown County period. Growing orchards and vegetable gardens was also seen as an experiment learning everything she could by reading books and magazines. She would then try to communicate her findings with the locals in Brown County, which was not well received, mainly due to illiteracy. Many of the bulletins she ordered for general distri distribution were found under rugs for padding and were often used to start fires. Adding to her list of countryside skills, Selma would go on to raise chickens and bees. She became quite skilled at managing the property and relied on her neighbor's two sons for work outdoors. On the way down the historic pathway to, towards Dewar Cabin, Selma had two cisterns installed for an emergency water supply in the case of a fire. Dewar Cabin, which held a family of 16 originally, was moved here by Selma as a trailside museum in honor of her brother, Walter, who was an amateur naturalist. Many of Selma's original plantings or their descendants still survive today, one of which includes a wisteria vine on the house's pergola. This house, or sorry, this plant is now over 100 years old. Should you visit during the spring, you'll be able to see hundreds of her daffodils across the site and several of her original peonies in the formal garden. Because Selma, util or sorry, because Steele utilized Selma's gardens in multiple paintings, the Indiana State Museum and historic sites were able to refer to these works to restore the formal garden, the lily ponds, and the rock garden in 2017. Although the original formal garden did not include a fence, one was installed to help keep out the deer, something that Selma didn't have to worry too much about when she arrived. Two remote studios with large windows were built in the case of inclement weather on the 211 acres for the painter to use while he was painting on the grounds. In 2000, or sorry, in 1912, a small studio was built, and in 1916, Steele's Dream Studio was built by a local builder in the shape of a barn because, well, that's the design that the local uh, builders were familiar with. 
It was the largest gallery owned by a single artist in the Midwest at the time of its opening. And when it was finished, the seal saw 1,000 visitors per year afterwards. We call this the large studio. The high northern windows, the large exhibition walls, and the storage were exactly what Steele needed. He actively sold artwork throughout his life, so this was truly an art gallery with art available for purchase. The large studio was also use useful when putting finishing touches on his artwork and for entertaining guests. Of these important guests were the following artists. Will Vodder, who illustrated 11 volumes of James Wickham Riley poems, and whom we believe to be in the central photo uh, with Steele in the large studio. Steele can be seen on uh, the couch on the screen. Adolf Scholz, who also moved to the area from Wisconsin after visiting Steele. Gustav Baumann, a woodblock uh, printer, who engraved Steele's fireplace with the quote, every morning I take off my hat to the beauty of the world. William Forsyth, one of the Hoosier Group painters, and photographer and journalist Frank Hohenberger, who you've seen several of his photographs by now. If you visit today, you can see the large studio the way Steele had it. Although we have organized the paintings on the walls to tell the story of his art career. Represented in the large studio are the three periods of the artist's life. The Munich period, the Brookville period, which I did not speak about today, and the Brown County period. We use photographs taken in the large studio during Seal's life to inform how we exhibit it today. Worth noting here is a very small portion of Selma's extensive shawl collection that hangs on the banister just the way she placed them during their time here. Throughout his life, Seal continued to paint portraits, earning $500 per portrait when he returned from Munich. He would go on to paint nine official Indiana governor portraits, more than any other artist. In the Brown County period, you can see Selma's flowers in many of his artworks, including his final painting of pink peonies, which was unfinished. The timeline of his career ends with the Indiana University. To the west of Brown County is the city of Bloomington, home of Indiana University. Steele became IU's first artist in resident, and he would hold a studio on campus from 1922 until his death in 1926. Although the Seals did have a Model T, Selma drove it because it was way too fast for the painter. Traveling became more difficult as he got older, so they rented a home on campus and divided their time between Bloomington and Belmont. Steele would die from a gallbladder infection that was um, considered inoperable uh, during his lifetime. He would die on July 24th, 1926, at the age of 78. Artist and friend Will Vodder would carry his ashes during his funeral ceremony to his final resting place, which happens to be here at the TC Steel State Historic Site. On the right, you can see a hand drawn map um, of the site made by Selma prior to Steele's passing. Her marketing efforts of the site being an art sanctuary for visitors paid off because in 1921, the Indianapolis News reported that 2,000 people had visited Steele's home and studio that year. After the painter's death, Selma would support herself by charging for tours much like we do today. For a quarter, you can go inside the buildings, 
for 50 cents, you would get a guided tour. She would also sell a few of the painter's artworks and sell her eggs and produce alongside hot, um, Highway 46 as she became quite good at gardening. A few months before her passing in 1945, Selma would sign a deed of gift to the state of Indiana, leaving 350 paintings, 211 acres, five hiking trails, six historic buildings, her gardens, and all of her home furnishings. By doing this, she ensured the legacy of her husband would be protected and his last home and studio would become a museum and an inspiration for artists and visitors for many years to come. Today, our collection of TC Seal paintings can be seen in the house in studio. Again, Selma left us 350 paintings, not all of which are in view at one time. We do, however, rotate in and out several paintings every year, giving the artwork time to rest and time for conservation if needed. This is a photo of an art rotation in progress, which typically happens every September. During the 1920s through the 1940s, the Brown County Art Colony fueled the economic development of this region. As a response to the increased demand for their work, they established the Brown County Art Gallery in 1926, the same year as Steele's passing. This um, gallery, as Valerie mentioned, is still in existence today. Part of this group were notable artists such as Lucy Hearthrath, Marie Goth, Will Vodder, Adolf Schultz, and Carl Graf, to name a few. In 1954, several of the original art colony artists founded an additional gallery due to demand called the Brown County Art Guild, which is also still in existence today. Nashville, Indiana continues to be a tourist destination, especially during the fall. The artist colony of Brown County still exists today. Every October, artists welcome visitors into their working studios during the Back Roads of Brown County studio tour, created to promote working artists and their studios. This tour is self-guided and offers a wide range of mediums after 25 years since the tour's creation. If you are in Brown County, Indiana during October or any time of the year, please support, support our local artists. We offer a variety of programming supporting Indiana artists, such as our annual Great Outdoor Art Contest, our Arts of the Earth Day, and Painting Selma's Garden. Our youth programming includes school tours, homeschool Thursday, summer camps, and our early childhood program called Curious Kids. We also offer an Alzheimer's program and annual and seasonal programming such as Seals Country Christmas and Ghost Stories Under the October Sky. Our artist in residence program is available to emerging established artists of all mediums. The building on the right was named La Casita by Selma. Artists in residence have the option to stay in this historic building, but know that it was once a chicken coop and a tool shed, so there may be some spiders as your bunk mates. The building on the left is TC Seal's little studio. Built in 1912, the studio has gone through many transformations. Today, it is used primarily by artists and residents to provide workshops and demonstrations for our visitors. If interested in becoming an artist and resident, please uh, fill out an application online and a fee is required. Please find more details on our website. 
Available in our museum shop is the book, The House of the Singing Winds, The Life and Work of T.C. Steele, written by Selma Steele and Theodore L. Steele, who is T.C. Steele's grandson, also by Wilter Pete and Rachel Perry. Also available for purchase is our uh, is the recent award-winning PBS documentary on T.C. Steele called Singing Winds. To continue the tradition of supporting artists in Brown County, we represent many local artists in our museum shop. We are open Wednesday through Sunday, 10 a.m. through 5 p.m. And we offer timed tours at 1015, 115, and 315. Scheduling a tour in advance is recommended for we do sell out, especially during the autumn months. You can register online or by calling 812-988-2785. Our site is closed on Thanksgiving, Christmas Eve, and Christmas Day. Adults are $10, seniors are eight, youth ages three to 17 are five, and under two are free. We also offer military and teacher discounts. Visit our website for details. You can visit our website, www.indianamuseum.org slash historic sites slash TC Steel for tour and program registration, as well as information on our artist in residency program. We invite you all to visit the TC Steel State Historic Site and hope to see you soon. Oh my gosh, um, thank you so much, Jessica, for providing such a thorough and fascinating look into the lives uh, and work of TC Still and Selma. The You can't tell the story of him without her is, is so clear. Um, I've loved learning more about uh, both their creative legacies and about the ongoing work that is happening at your site. Um, we're now going to move into the Q&A portion of this presentation. I see a few questions sort of trickling in. Um, so once again, please use the Q&A box to send your questions or comments in, and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, but I'm going to selfishly start with one of my own. Um, so when we've seen in your slides uh, some really cool comparisons between Steele's work um, and historic and some contemporary images. And I'm curious, for someone visiting the site today, um, are many of these few you should still present, like, do they look very much the same or have they changed a bit? They changed quite a bit. Um, so when TC Steele was here painting on the grounds, he could see 15 miles to the west. He could see oh, the wow. smokestacks at Indiana University. So today we can see um, several feet. Um, so it is nowhere near the view that um, Steele had during his time. Um, again, the land in Brown County was over farmed. Uh, mm -hmm. The farms were failing due to um, bad soil. Um, it was just exhausted land. So uh, farmers were abandoning their farms and saplings were growing up in their place. And now those saplings are, you know, very large trees. <laughs> yeah, oh, I bet. Yeah, there's in so many of the works, um, the, the field is quite clear, right? Yes, those are now forests is what it sounds like. Exactly. <laughs> um, hold on, let me get questions up. All right, uh, let's see. Um, are any still family members uh, still involved in the historic sites uh, interpretation or work? It sounds like there were grandchildren um, of Steels who um, maybe are still around or have descendants. Can you tell us more about that? Yes, um, so we do. Um, we get, first of all, we get visitors who are related to the Steels or Selma Neubacher um, Steel um, come all the time and tell us stories. And we do write those down, things that have been passed down. Um, but the Steele family um, does have members that come regularly. Um, David Steele, um, who is a so many Downs grandson of T.C. Steele. Um, 
he really is involved with the Friends of T.C. Steel, a group that supports the historic site and his legacy. Um, so he was a former president of the Friends of T.C. Steel, and we see him, um, I would say, maybe every couple of months he'll pop in, um, which is great. We love having that connection to the family. It's really, really awesome that we can. It's amazing. I know at uh, the site I work for, um, there's still many family members in the area, and it's always really fun when they come and share stories or memories. Yes. Um, about about especially the home, right? Not only the artists, but I think the spaces, which is really really cool. Uh, let's see. So, um, I'm curious about the artist colony of Brown County. Um, how it you know has these origins from the early 1900s. Um, from what you know, how has it changed or remained the same since uh, T.C. Steele's involvement with the group? Um, I think it's first important to, again, say that Steele, while he was connected to the art colony, he wasn't necessarily part of the art colony. Um, you know, when they're in horse and buggy, it's quite a distance, um, that 14 miles uh, between Nashville and Belmont. Um, but to answer your question, um, it's from the time of Steele's death in 1926, the art colony was just really getting going. Um, so it's expanding. Um, they start an official, you know, I don't want to say club, but um, sure. an official group, um, which the association with the um, Brown County Art Gallery was created. And as these artists are painting, um, the state and the country are seeing these artworks. So it's really driving tourism, um, which is not dissimilar from what happens today. Mm. Um, our local um, artists, um, art colonists, um, they, they have exhibits all over the state. They um, go to paint outs all over the Midwest. Um, so in that regard, they are similar, um, but you know, the back roads of Brown County, there's still a group. Um, the IHA, the Indiana Heritage Arts is another historic um, entity in Brown County um, and it supports all Indiana artists. Um, it's, I think, 50 years old, still a, a historic organization um, that is very involved with the art gallery, um, TC Steel, um, and the gallery, and um, IHA. We all put on painting Selma's Garden as a way for, you know, these historic um, entities in the community to work together. So I guess that's a long way no, <laughs> getting to the point. It, it sounds like it's still very much a thriving creative uh, community and that the, the steel house uh, continues to be a place where creatives gather or can. There's that sense of community there. Yes, absolutely. We have artists coming all the time uh, just to paint on the grounds or they'll come for our organized events. So it's really great. I love it when the artists are here. Amazing. Um, let's see. Oh, I think let's make, do you have time for maybe one more quick question before we part? Okay. Yeah. So the lectures come in. Um, so uh, someone who's curious about art storage. Um, so where do, you know, what's happening with the artworks when they're not on display, especially since you have such a large collection? That's a great question. Um, since we are part of the Indiana State Museum and Historic Sites, the majority of our storage is at the Indiana State Museum. As a historic site, we don't have the proper um, uh, storage areas um, sure. for these paintings, um, but the Indiana State Museum has very amazing um, controlled, which we do control our buildings uh, with humidity and all of that, but 
the Indiana State Museum is who has all of our paintings in storage. And then they bring them to us every September and we send them back. <laughs> nice. That sounds like a really a great collaboration, especially storage can be hard um, for, for works over time. Um, well, there's there's more questions in here, but I think uh, for time's sake, we, we do have to wrap up. Um, so I, I do want to say thank you so much, Jessica and Valerie, for taking, you know, expertise, your time and your energy um, and feeding that into today's presentation. Um, it is always such a delight to continue this collaboration, um, not only with FAWS, but with every site, such as the TC Steel State Historic Site, um, on this virtual road trip. As always, our thanks to Lavona for providing ASL interpretation. What would we do without you? Um, we're so thankful to have you help us make this more accessible. Um, as promised, links are available in the chat uh, to related resources, websites, mailing lists, and the playlist. I know someone asked about, um, as well in the chat, about where are all these recordings, and they are all available on YouTube, um, and the link is in the chat, so you can see all three seasons uh, up to date of this uh, series. Um, and this has been recorded, so and it will get online within the next few days. So next month, we're gonna continue our virtual adventure um, to visit historic Westwood um, in Tennessee. And we really hope that you will join us then. Thank you everyone and good night.